Let us pray. God of all truth, when we think we have our life all figured out, we pray you hold up the mirror of your word. Reflect back to us your mercy and your love offered to us through Christ. Amen. Our scripture today is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. Listen for the word of the Lord. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other, for all who, all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I drove by a billboard this past week that read only, He Gets Us along with a web address. And my Christian brain somehow knew that the he in that sentence must be Jesus, but I didn't think more about it. Until a couple days later, an article found its way into my feed. The headline read, A hundred million dollar ad campaign wants to fix Jesus' image. His followers remain a problem. (laughs) The article reads, Launched earlier this year, ads featuring online videos about Jesus as a rebel or an activist or host of a dinner party have been viewed more than 300 million times. Billboards with messages like, Jesus let his hair down too, and Jesus went all in too, have also been posted in major markets. The 100 million was donated by a small group of wealthy, anonymous families that just want people to give Jesus a shot. So if you go to hegetsus.com, you can chat live or text for prayer and positive vibes or set up an online Bible reading plan. They also have merchandise available on the site, a t-shirt, that says Jesus was wrongly judged to, or a cap that says Jesus was a refugee. These items are for sale, but not for money. In exchange for purchase, the buyer clicks to agree to help a neighbor or welcome a stranger. Forgive your mother, get a hat. (laughs) One critic of the campaign, though, observes that marketing Jesus comes with an inherent flaw Most of the people already using the product, meaning Christians, aren't worth admiring. Between televangelists, megachurch leaders, hypocritical politicians, campus evangelists, hate preachers, lazy apologists, everyone at Pure Flix and Franklin Graham, the amount of harm caused by the most visible Jesus followers can't be understated. And let's be honest, when I hear a list of names and figures like the one I just read out, I can't be the only person in this room who thinks to myself, I'm a better kind of Christian than they are. My church is way better than their church. Thank you, God, that I'm not like them. But before we go too far down that path, I want to say that this is not a sermon about the dangers of self-righteousness or about humbling oneself before God. It's a sermon about grace. It's a sermon about mercy. 
the mercy of God that falls on the just and the unjust alike, about the love of God that sent Jesus, from whom we receive grace upon grace upon grace. And then in community, we represent God to the world. In our text today, Jesus is telling a parable, and our English word parable is from a Greek word, para, this little preposition that means alongside, or near, or in the vicinity. This is what a parable does. It's a story that comes alongside our everyday experience, such that God draws near and reveals self as we are invited to enter the vicinity of God's realm here on earth, parables, parables, come alongside. And in the story Jesus sets up, we meet this Pharisee. He isn't just any righteous first century Jewish person. He is the righteous first century Jewish person. He's committed himself to living according to God's covenant instruction to Israel. He goes above and beyond with his fasting and his donating, and he prays all the prayers that good Jewish men of his time prayed. If you want to be an image of a person who's in God's good graces, you can look at this Pharisee. And then there's this tax collector. His occupation makes him complicit with the occupying empire, known for extorting his kinsfolk for his own benefit. And on the surface of the text, this tax collector doesn't necessarily regard God much at all. He passes by the temple in the course of his day, doesn't even look toward it. He makes an ask for mercy while holding on to his identity as sinner and goes on his way without any repentance likely to continue in his work of upholding oppression and betraying his community. If you want an image of a person who shouldn't be in God's good graces, it's him. But then the turnabout. Jesus says that this man, this tax collector, went home justified before God. In Greek, he went home justified para, the other man, justified alongside the other man. Both Pharisee and tax collector went home justified. Many English translations, like the one I just read, say the tax collector was justified rather than the Pharisee. But Jewish biblical scholar Amy Jill Levine points out that that's a translation rooted in an anti-Semitic interpretation of this text, a translation that wants to diminish the value of Jewish righteousness while upholding a supposedly penitent tax collector who relies on grace alone. Grace alone is an especially Protestant Christian value. But we remember that Jesus was not a Christian. Jesus and his listeners would have had no problem with this Pharisee's brand of righteousness. In fact, it was something to be commended. For the Pharisees sought to uphold the good for their community in the midst of an ongoing crisis. Jesus' problem, rather, was with some Pharisees thinking that their acts of righteousness put them in a special category before God looking down on others when, in reality, God intended for their goodness to para, to come alongside their neighbors and be transformative within their community as a demonstration of the goodness of God that extends to all without consideration of individual righteousness. For all people are on equal footing before the divine, when the proud are brought down and the humble are raised up, all finish on a level plane. 
When I was at Seattle U, I got to take a few seminary classes with Father Michael Roshko. One of them was called Christian Anthropology and Exploration of Fundamental Matters of Faith, like the nature of God and what it means to be human, what is sin, what is grace. I remember in our class discussions on sin, students could define it pretty easily in both religious and secular terms. Sin was easy. But no one at first had a compelling definition for grace. Would you? Even though it's such a central topic in Christian theology, what is it really? Is it just receiving something we don't deserve? It's kind of depressing. Is it only overlooking wrongs and extending forgiveness? I think yes, but there's more. Finally, Father Roshko put it simply for us. Grace is when God reveals God's own self. When we encounter some flash of the divine in the world, that's grace. And yes, it can be forgiveness. It can be forbearance. It may even be undeserved sometimes. But it's warmth. It's goodness. Grace. A child's enthusiasm. Grace. A meal prepared and served with care. Grace. A good deed in the hardest times. To a friend in crisis or a stranger in distress. Grace and grace. When we put into practice the things that Jesus taught, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, welcoming the stranger, visiting the lonely, releasing the prisoner, selling our possessions and giving all the money to the poor, these are some of the ways God reveals self in the world, sometimes through you and sometimes through me. Grace upon grace upon grace. And as a community of faith, we, like the Pharisees, carry out a similar purpose of representing some of humanity's goodness to God, even as we represent God's goodness to the world. There's a story in the book of Genesis where God has heard about what's going on in the city of Sodom. It's everybody's favorite Bible story. And what's going on in the city of Sodom is arrogance, an excess of food, prosperous ease for those within the city, but no mercy or care for needy outsiders who come looking for aid to share in the plenty. These folks are met with violence. There's no sign of God's heart or God's values in Sodom, no parah, no coming alongside, no grace there. So the mythic God of the story is heading down to bring vengeance on behalf of all the poor and needy folks the inhabitants have violated. And Abraham, the Israelite patriarch, travels alongside God and asks God a question hey, God, let's say there are 50 people in Sodom still acting justly, doing good, still helping needy outsiders. Would you destroy them too? Would you destroy the whole city when 50 people there still reveal your heart like that? God answers, no. If there are 50, I will forgive the entire city for their sake. Abraham goes one further. If I may, let me just ask one more thing. Let's say there are five less than 50. Would you destroy the whole place just because there were five less people acting justly, doing good, helping the needy, bringing grace? No, God says. If there are 45, I'll forgive the entire city for the sake of 45. Abraham takes courage. 
But what about 40, though? God says, 40, fine. Abraham says, 30? 30. 20? 20. Abraham says, don't be mad, God. Suppose 10 are found, 10 people acting justly, doing good, helping the needy, revealing your heart and bringing grace. God says, 10 is all there needs to be. Theologian Jessica Price observes an interesting connection that 10 is also the minimum number of people necessary to say Kaddish, a hymn praising God that is recited during Jewish prayer services. Because based on this story, 10 is the dividing line between what's just a handful of Jewish folks and an actual Jewish community. That difference is important in Jewish thought where the Sodom story is used as proof that a critical mass of good people can change a toxic community. If, however, the number of good people dips below that critical mass, the community will change the good people for the worse faster than they can change it for the better. Community matters. So whereas some strains of Christian theology see any sin as being enough to condemn you, according to a more Jewish outlook, which was Jesus' outlook, any mitzvah, any blessing, any goodness should be enough to raise up not only the good deed doer, but everyone around them as well. Jesus' point in his parable is that the goodness of this Pharisee should have been a beacon guiding others toward God rather than, in some cases, a personal boundary keeping those others away. So I wonder how we might enter this work here today. Coming alongside others here at church or in other areas of our lives to bring a critical mass of God's goodness into a world desperately in need of it. Drawing near to friends and strangers alike such that all are invited to enter the realm of God, where material needs are met, where sickness is healed and toxicity is cast out, where God's revealing of self, divine grace, flows in all and through all. Our scriptures remind us that God is able to provide us with every grace in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, we may share abundantly in every good work. Frederick Buechner once said, a miracle is when the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. A miracle is when one plus one equals a thousand. So friends, may we be part of the miracle, upholding the goodness that's in the world still, whether it be a goodness of resource or of justice or of spirit, that it may flow wherever it's needed as we rely on God's grace to us in Christ to para, to come alongside our weary world, as through you and through me, God is drawing near to put things in right order and to make all things new. For these things we pray together. Amen.